We are back with another edition of Between the Horns, presented by your Southern California Toyota dealers, Stu DeMarco and JB, no longer in Denver. That was a long week. Yeah, we, we can breathe. <laughs> it feels good to be home for yeah. that reason and, and many others. Of Do you have trouble sleeping at altitude? A little bit. Did you? I thought it was just me. Oh, good. Yeah, but it's more than offset <laughs> with how well I sleep when I'm away from my family, right? So this is true. <laughs> privacy yes. and silence of a hotel said. room. <laughs> <laughs> How are we feeling today? It's uh, always a bittersweet uh, time of year, isn't it? In mm. terms of um, some players that we've got to know and like this summer yeah. have been released. Hopefully many of them will be on the practice squad that will be released by the time uh, this podcast is published. Uh, but it's also excitement for so many new Los Angeles Rams who have made, I want to be careful to say, the first, not the final by any means, the first 53-man roster. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, it, it's a weird day. I mean, here we go. You're getting ready for week one in Seattle, and you have your football team, so there is excitement there. But, you know, it's always a tough day, you know, when guys get cut, lose their jobs, have to find other places to work. But it is what it is. Everyone had an opportunity. You, know, you had practice reps. You had game reps. And they're going to pick the best 53 they can or the, the guys they think that could help win a championship. So you're excited about that, but it is a weird day coming off yesterday. Yeah, definitely strange and, and very different, especially when you, you eventually get to the point where you're going from seeing 90 people out there on the practice field and observing them and, and you know everything that's going on to now having that down to 53. But uh, you know the good thing is for this coaching staff and the front office is that they got – joint practices with the Broncos, joint practices with the Raiders, as well as three preseason games to really uh, get this thing nailed down. Again, at least the uh, initial version here. So uh, excited to see where this goes. Yeah, total moving target. It's probably changed since we sat down in these chairs, and we'll find out more as soon as we're done with this podcast. But uh, let's go around the horn a couple of times. Like big picture reactions. Do you want to lead off? Like what's your major takeaway from what you saw transpire yesterday? I think the biggest thing for me was just how different the outside linebacker room looks or how different the edge position looks just because you look at I mentioned this kind of in the article announcing the initial 53 you look at the bodies and the and the players that were there last year and, and who's there this year that room has completely turned over and so um, you know whereas last year there was you know Leonard Floyd you had, you had Terrell Lewis you had Justin Hollins um, you know, among others. Now this year, you've got Michael Hoyt, who committed to learning the outside linebacker position and, and training there full time this off season, as well as uh, a trio of rookies and Byron Young, Nick Hampton, and uh, and O'Shawn Mathis at least until O'Shawn until he goes on to IR, as Sean mentioned yesterday. But uh, that group is going to be really interesting to watch because it is not only is it much younger compared to last year as far as again that initial group, um, but it's one that is also um, a little bit inexperienced and, and there's I feel like gonna be a lot of learning there a little bit inexperienced that's a nice way to put it <laughs> just I, underselling I, it I guess dead wrong there <laughs> leaving Denver I mean if you look what the, the Rams would have had six sacks in the preseason and you cut three guys uh, Copeland had one Kier Thomas had two and a half and Hardy had a half sack so I was surprised um, but it, you know, it is what it is. You, you're going with inexperienced and young guys. So uh, the second one for me it, along those lines is D-line. You know, in Bobby Brown we trust, in Ernest Brown we trust. Um, you're, you're looking for guys that could be good teammates or, or sidekicks for Aaron Donald. Kobe uh, Turner. Uh, Kobe Turner. Oh, I love the way he plays. Uh, as soon as we saw his explosiveness, I, I see where you're going to play him. But uh, just a little bit of shock there. I, I was surprised by Copeland being cut. Uh, that was very interesting, but, 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 if you're a fourth-year guy playing in a third preseason game, you know, they're telling you what's up. They need you to stand out, and I think that might have been the problem. You didn't stand out enough against first- and second-year dudes, so uh, good for the guys that made it, but that was a mild shock for me that a guy like Marquise Copeland wouldn't make this football team. Same with Robert Rochelle, mm -hmm. right? When you're out there in the second half of preseason game number three, the writing's kind of on the wall, so to your point about being surprised, I'll say it it looks shocking on paper to see an offensive, an outside linebacker group that really only has Michael Hoyt returning to it. And even he was not even a, a glimmer in the edge's eye until deep in last season. Uh, but at the same time, no one differentiated themselves last season at that position. The Rams threw numbers at that position through the draft and college free agency. So we kind of knew it was coming that this was going to have a much different composition, including a new position coach 
at outside linebacker. Yeah, well, I mean, look, um, it, it comes back to Raheem Morris. I mean, this is what you got. Now, how do you generate pressure? You saw what happened last year. Uh, Bobby Wagner was a big part of that pass rush. I would expect a lot more of that, plus some faster guys coming off the edge. So we'll see. Who knows? Maybe Byron Young could you know, turn that body into something special. I mean, getting off the bus, he does look scary, and he's got the most potential. And Michael Hoyt, maybe he's got something in, in, in store for us that we don't know. But as it looks right now, there's a lot of inexperience at outside linebacker. Walk us through the O'Shawn Mathis decision and what that means for the Rams in the first half of this schedule. Right. So with O'Shawn, he's expected to go onto injured reserve. Um, in order for a player to be designated to return from IR, they have to be – on the initial 53-man roster past that deadline, which, again, was Tuesday at 1 p.m., um, which, again, if for those who don't know with roster rules and things like that, if you're placed on the, uh, if, for example, the reserve physically unable to perform list before that deadline, that means that you're ineligible to return for the first four games. So you're going to miss at least the first four games. Um, or if you're placed on injured reserve, then you're not eligible to return this season. And so by keeping O'Shawn on the 53 and then making that move after the deadline that allows some flexibility as far as when he can return rather than just saying okay he's going to be we, he's going to be sidelined for the first four games or not going to come back at all and I've stood next to you as you stood next to him on the practice field and I know you think he looks the part definitely looks the part uh we were riding the elevator together and i'm like oh my god i see it uh you're tall you're from the same planet as jalen ramsey i hope you can play as well but a tall corner when you see guys like that the first thing i thought was okay that's dk insurance you got another big body to toss at another big body you're talking about me and nikella witherspoon yeah right? yeah i'm yeah. sorry yeah, yeah. yeah. oshawn mathis outside linebacker yeah right? he's cut more in the uh, terrell lewis Oh, my God. Cloth in yeah. terms of what he brings to this roster. Levers. Uh, when he extends, you go backwards about three yards. Now, if you can get some explosion with that, mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's clay there to work with, no doubt. Last time we gathered in Denver, we were talking about the possibility of the Rams only keeping two quarterbacks. Uh, Stetson Bennett had ascended through two preseason games, not so much in Denver. How has that altered your feeling about where the Rams are in terms of their quarterback depth chart to start this year? Well, I think there's just like you would expect with any rookie quarterback or any rookie at any position, there's going to be some learning moments, still going to be some learning moments and, and growing pains, I would say. Um, it was a little different because, and this was something that I you know mentioned in my five takeaways after the game, that you know he did show a, a, a knack or a, an ability, I should say, to bounce back from some of those mistakes that he made. Um, it didn't quite work out that way, obviously, against the Broncos, but I still think that there's a lot that can be taken away from that and that he'll learn from that'll benefit him down the road. And so um, I think ultimately it's a good reminder that, look, it's not going to be perfect. And there's still a lot that, you know, Stetson has to learn and, and not every game will be, you know, again, like the preseason game against the Chargers or like the preseason game against the Raiders. And so it doesn't do too much for me, at least as far as any sort of worry or concern, it's just, okay, you know, there are still some things that clearly he has to work on, and, and that's just going to be something that I think fans will have to understand going in, especially with him, you know, serving as QB2 for now. Fans and understanding? Okay, that's fun. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I like it. The growing pains, and the pains aren't his. When you turn the ball over, it's offensive linemen that have to go cover. That's the painful part. So uh, I thought it was clear early. I mean, he's got some juice. Uh, there's something there. He's got potential. I think he's in the perfect situation to learn. So... You know, thank God he's not the starter yet, but eventually, say in November, December, when he actually learns the program and he gets to watch Matt Stafford, um, he could become a guy that you might think would be a starter. But I thought in the preseason, watching him play, clearly it's not too big for him. He's great in the press conference, and he's a guy that understands his mistakes and learns from his mistakes. That, to me, tells me he could be a great backup. We all expect there to be a third arm out on the practice field if there isn't already by way of the practice squad. And we also know, we've been saying it all summer, that Matthew Stafford's been excellent, and the 2023 Rams are predicated on keeping him upright and keeping him active. Oh, yeah, right, absolutely. The, the whole game changes, and this isn't unique to the Rams if you lose your starting quarterback. Yeah, that's no matter the who's guy. Behind. That's the guy. He is the number one asset. you got to keep him upright. If, if you – protect Matthew Stafford, you have a pretty good chance to win that football game no matter who you're playing against. All right, let's go to the offensive line next because you dropped it there. I think two really notable items since we last spoke. 
Kevin Dotson traded from the Pittsburgh Steelers to the Rams, and Logan Bruss, who was the top pick of two drafts ago, uh, released as of yesterday. You can tell me where you want to start, but I think they kind of go hand in hand. With Bruss, uh, you know, it was, you know, struggling physically even into last preseason, preseason before the injury. I think it was Morgan Fox who ran him over. So that's okay. He's going to learn from there. And then he got hurt, and then he's coming back. And I, I'm not sure if I was talking to you or Adam or Maurice uh, when he got hurt in this year's preseason game. So he's got a left knee and a right ankle. That's going to be hard to anchor in and play offensive line. So um, you gave him reps. It is what it is. Uh, Dodson's coming in. I don't know where you play him or what your starting five is. That's what I was doing before we started the show. Um, who do you put on the bench? And where do you play Dodson? He's a guy that's played left guard. Well, that's where Steve Avila's going to play. So who's going to play right guard? So uh, I think you have some pretty good bodies if you factor in AJ, uh, Alar Jackson, and then Joe Noteboom and figure out your center. I think you have seven guys for five spots, and I think it'll take about a month to figure out which starting five it's going to be. I've got some thoughts on Russ, but do you want to fill out the picture on Dotson, why the Rams brought him in and where he starts at least? Not starts in terms of on the offensive line, but where he starts his Rams career. Sure. So one thing that Sean mentioned yesterday that it was that he has the ability to play on the left or right side. So it sounds like right guard in a depth role could be a possibility. Um, that was one of the things uh, you know that McVay mentioned as well as far as just kind of the initial thought for bringing him in. So um, you know we'll kind of see where that goes, but. Um, you know, McVeigh was a big fan of his, loved his toughness and, and physicality, which are obviously two very important and uh, requisite attributes that you need to play offensive line. And that's also another big body, too. I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah, Steve Avila, he's 6'3", around 330. Dotson, 6'4", 321. Again, whether that's a depth roll, whether he starts, we'll, we'll see. But yeah. either way, I, to have that kind of size as – depth at least is is a really good thing especially when you take into context the uh season that was 2020 yeah they're, they're buying group. the same size underwear no doubt <laughs> there's some big fellas yeah can i play apologist both for the rams and for logan for a second yeah no one likes this decision right like this is not the outcome that anyone wanted nor foresaw zach right. thomas likes it true <laughs> yeah. true and, yeah. and and i can go there too which yeah. is to say there was a spirit and culture of competition mm -hmm that was brought to this year's off season because of how last year went, because there being a new position coach there, but a new offensive coordinator, mm -hmm. there's a new direction on this offensive line. Logan predates that. It didn't all go in his favor, whether it's the injury, the position change, any of those sorts of things. But he was also drafted outside the top 100. I get it, he's the top of your draft class from two years ago, but he was a third round comp pick. Okay, this wasn't like a first round miss. Still disappointing. I still hope there's a bright future for him in this league, whether with the Rams or with another team. But if you don't miss on that one, maybe you don't find your way to Steve Avila. True. And Very if he true. turns into the Pro Bowl guard that you said last week he can be, in the end, this might be a good thing. And if you're criticizing the evaluation of Bruss, totally fair. I think the organization is looking internally to make sure they learn from that experience too. But at the same time, offensive line has become the hardest position to evaluate in the college game, no question. And the same group may have found the left tackle of the future as an undrafted college free agent in Alaric Jackson. So it's about your batting average, right? Oh, no doubt. You gotta look yeah. at this in totality. It's okay to be disappointed with the micro, but also I think I'm still encouraged with the macro picture of what this 23 offensive line can be. I'm with you. And just one more word for me about Bruss. I think he's going to catch on someplace at some point and reach his potential. It just, it is what it is. Uh, you know, you got injured, you got banged up. And like you said, it was completely competitive and some guys outplayed you. So be it. Then get better and find another team. That's just the way it goes. Um, but Dodson coming in. I am so glad you said that about the right guard spot because I was looking at it. I'm like, if you can put both of these guys, Avila and Dodson, on the field at the same time, then you've got some nasty. You've got some absolute nasty that you can take up to San Francisco and go nose to nose with those guys again. That would be a little bit different. If you can hold up a tackle with those guys, then you have a chance of beating the one, one of the best teams in the NFC and the NFC West. Let's go skill guys for a second, okay? Because four tight ends is a big number for a team that's largely been predicated on 11 personnel under Sean McVay. Four running backs and six receivers. Your thoughts, your reactions? I'll, I'll start with the receivers first, just because I know on the last show I mentioned that it was a possibility. I think that you could have six, potentially seven, depending on special teams math and how you viewed that position in certain guys. And obviously they end up with six there. And 
Um, I'm sure it was a, a tough decision with Tyler Johnson, especially who seemed like he had done some nice things in the preseason too. But um, it's a it's a di- it's a different group than um, I think maybe expected. Like I said, as far as like not sure if they would go with six or if they would go with seven. And so um, you know, Demarcus Robinson, you know, making making that group was was really great to see. I thought he had a spectacular camp and preseason. Um, you know, someone who who really uh, you know, I think carved out a role for himself and uh, really interested to, in seeing what happens with Puka Nakua as well because, uh, you know, McVeigh just mentioned yesterday in his press conference after the 53 got announced that he's someone that one of the four uh, young players or rookies that had earned the right to be an immediate contributor. And so hmm. uh, a, lot, a lot of different things going on with that group that does also look a little bit different compared to last year, but one that I'm excited to see. Well, I, I think it, uh, McVeigh likes tight ends. I can't remember his name. He was in Washington. He was the tight end Pro Bowl guy. They kind of made his name with Cousins. Jordan, yeah. Jordan Reed. Jordan Reed. And look, it's it's no shock with this offense that it's multiple. And I think because of who he had at receiver, he kind of modified the offense. But he likes throwing to tight ends. 12 personnel, 11 personnel, even 13 personnel. Uh, you can make a defense pay that way. So I like having four tight ends uh, when you have four different options, four guys that can do different things and have different combos. It really messes up a defense when you got to figure out which one's the receiver and you might miss one and there he goes. Uh, so there's that. With receiver, Robinson, I, <clears throat> I heard a comparison and I really liked. Do you guys remember Brandon Lloyd? <laughs> that oh, yeah. just sick athleticism with great catches? I'm like, he does remind me of this guy. The way he goes up and can adjust to the football and bring that thing in. So uh, I think you have different combos. Imagine if you have Cooper Cup, Benny Skoranek, and Puka Nakua out there at the same time. Are you going to run it or throw it? Either way, it benefits the Rams. And if if they catch you slipping, either Benny can knock you out and so can Puka. That's what they're here for. And then Cooper Cup's got the skill. So you're, you've got the ability with these receivers and these tight ends to be very multiple and to personnel to death a defense. So that bodes well for a Sean McVay run offense. And you like Roy Freeman, too, is on the outside of the running back bubble. But as a vested free agent, he can pick his next destination, whether it's here in Thousand Oaks or elsewhere. He gave you something that maybe portions of the running back depth chart did not. Yeah, he's a big dude. If, if this was college and you had 100 guys, that's your third and short dude. Absolutely. Hand it to him. Just run over somebody, pick up the first down, hand it to the ref, walk off the field. But by keeping Zach Evans, the Rams actually kept all 14 of their draft picks, the largest class in modern history on their initial 53-man roster yeah it's a it's a really interesting running back group overall too because I think based on what we all saw in the preseason and training camp they each give you something different and gives you a lot of different options compared compared to maybe what you had to work with in the circumstances and context of, of last year but uh yeah for all 14 making making the 53 is uh something that I don't know I, I would have necessarily predicted. I mean, I think that's the hope for any organization or front mm-hmm. office. If you make that many selections is you hope that one, a handful of them can be immediate contributors mm. like McVay mentioned yesterday, but two, you know, you hope that, you know, and so all of them in some way can find a way to contribute, whether it's now or in the future. And so, uh, to, for all of them to make the 53 though, I mean, you, again, usually you have maybe one or two that will, land on the practice squad and things like that but all, all of them showed enough to you know make that strong impression to to be there and so it'll be interesting to see the the roles that they all have outside of again the, the four that I was kind of alluding to earlier looking forward to seeing that full practice squad because we know that there's going to be a 2023 contributor or multiple contributors from that group and there may even be a 2024 starter hmm. to emerge from from that training ground Uh, As interested as we all were to see the initial 53, I think we're more looking forward to seeing which 48 get helmets on that first Sunday of the season in Seattle. Let's take a look ahead to the Seahawks because now it's extended game week. Maybe we're not officially at game one yet, but it's okay to finally look an opponent in the eyes. Interesting that we finished there last year and start there this year. What's your impression of the Seattle Seahawks in 2023? It's going to be a really interesting group, primarily because of the emergence of Geno Smith and, and just the season that he had last year and the way that the uh, offense will look because, again, Shane Waldron's still coordinating that group. Um, and they've got a lot of different options at receiver, too. I mean, you, you still have, obviously, DK Metcalf and, and Tyler Lockett, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. But, you know, Jackson Smith and Jigba is, uh, you know, is a really impressive rookie that um, – 
you know, I, b I believe he, he got injured in the preseason and may or may not be available for that week one game. But, I mean, they'll, they'll see him at some point down the road here this season. But uh, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really interesting group, and I think they're very much in the conversation for, uh, you know, if not a wild card spot, uh, certainly, you know, being up there as a, as a contender to, to potentially win the NFC West. First round receiver, first round corner to go with last year's class that, you know, arguably had the offensive and defensive rookie of the year in Kenneth Walker and, and Tariq Wool. And there have been times Baller. this offseason where I've been tempted to say, you know what, I could see Seattle as a pick to win the West. I could see them as some people's favorite even over San Francisco. But that depends on what happens with San Fran in the quarterback spot, right? I mean, that's that's a tough situation. But right now, I mean, now that Kyler Murray is still on the men, Geno Smith is the most mobile quarterback in this division. So what are we talking about? Or what, what do we start talking about? Edge rushing. I mean, that's the best way to control those guys. So, you know, I still think you said the emergence of, of Geno Smith. It's like the reemergence of Geno Smith, the rebirth. Uh, the guys played well. And Pete Carroll seems to be ageless. And he's got energy. That team will have juice. And I'm trying to figure out who was more annoying to me, Golden Tate or Tyler Lockett. <laughs> they both drive me nuts because they keep winding up in the end zone. So, but I think with your young secondary and the way it's constructed now and I, I think you have the antidote for those guys to cover him up if, if, if you can keep Geno Smith in the pocket and under control. I saw at his press conference this week, he was asked because I guess he was an English or literature major in Morgantown, likes to read, like, what have you been reading? And he just said simply defenses. <laughs> <laughs> his first book or his first chapter of this season will be an interesting read, Raheem Morris's retooled defense. Yeah. And I actually this morning went back and looked at the starting lineup for last year's Week 18 game in Seattle. I'm not going to name any names, but with the Seahawks having everything to play for and the Rams ostensibly having nothing to play for, they nearly did walk out of there with an upset victory. So let's go back to the Pacific Northwest and let's have Matthew Stafford at the controls, Cooper Cup in the lineup, Aaron Donald in the middle of the defense, and see what happens. And line them up and let's see what happens. Absolutely. I mean, look, it's Seattle is always scary because it's Seattle, but the Rams can compete. Obviously, they can compete with the Seahawks. And I think everyone is chasing the 49ers right now until we figure out what happens at quarterback. But Seattle's loud. It's crazy. Uh, if you're not on your P's and Q's, they can get after you. And we haven't talked about the elephant in the room, special teams, which is what they do so well and what we're figuring out what we're going to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> to that point, should we go out on the grass and take a look at the uh, first 53 Los Angeles Rams as Let's they go. practice today as a group? For Stu, DeMarco, I'm JB Long. Thank you for joining us for this 53-man roster edition of Between the Horns, presented by your Southern California Toyota dealers. More changes, more details, more reports to come. Uh, Stu Jackson will have all that for you on the Rams.com and our social media platforms. Until next time, enjoy your Week Zero weekend. It's game week next.